all quantization. So what is the process of quantization? The process of quantization is the building of quantum theory that will have the correct classical. Suppose you have a classical theory. You discover it by some experiment. You have a classical theory. You have to build the quantum theory. That, in an appropriate limit, would reduce to that classical theory. That's the process of quantization. Okay? Now, basically, every quantization that we have, all the quantizations that we discuss in this class, that we usually discuss quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and textbooks. Um, so you have to say in what limit you will approach the classification. Basically, all the limits that we, uh, all the theory we have, have the feature that in the limit h bar goes to. They approach classification. But you could imagine another kind of quantization. A quantization of a theory in the following way. It's some quantum theory <coughs> that reduces to the classical system at hand in the limit of inverse of it. Okay. Such a quantization would be harder to guess. Because, you see, the way to guess the first kind of quantization is very easy. Because we have this lovely Feynman idea yeah, all these various tricks. We just take the classical action and use that to construct the path. But that won't work for these large elements. Why not? It's because the classical action is not what appears in the path. There are other conditions. Okay? So there is a second of the known classical elements of quantum systems. There are two. Okay? One we've exploited a lot. The second one we've not touched very much. Some people, I mean, string theory is going to be but 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 if not, not in really mainstream physics, not touched very much. And not not in physics very well. I mean, you know, one should be very aware of this because given a classical system, the right way to quantize it may turn out to be in the logic. Now there is a quite magnificent thing that's happened in the study of string theory of late. It's called the ADS safety correspondence. You know, the ADS safety correspondence is the following thing. There's a particular theory of gravity. Okay. It's got a name. It's called 2B gravity on ADS 5 plus S5. The details of that. Some particular theory of gravity interacts with a lot of things. It's classic. Question what is its quantization? Possibly there are many answers to this question. But we see, we feel we know for sure that one answer to this question. Maybe it's unique answer. Is that the correct quantization of this theory is the large end limit of four dimensional h? Okay. This is a magnificent answer because it's unparalleled. You know, every previous attempt at straightforward quantization of gravity has been to take the gravity action, put it in the path integral, and do the integral over the metric. If this situation, at least for this particular gravity theory, is right, that was wrong because we were trying to quantize gravity in this h goes to zero. The right way to quantize, at least one right way to quantize this, in this case, was the n goes to infinity. And if that's the case, many things sort of fall into place. Why is it so hard to find a correct quantum, a quantum theory of gravity? It's because everyone's approaching the problem is completely wrong. The right way is n goes to infinity. And that's great, exactly. It's very hard to know if you've got a particular feature. <coughs> if the n goes to infinity, right? Uh, very hard to know what the right thing It will reduce to some classical system. <coughs> that's a very hard question to answer a priori. Okay. Now, in our little foray into the subject, it's a big subject of potentially great way of. Um, it's a very important question, as you can see from me. Sir, uh, so, so we should get the same answer whether we take h cross going to 0 or the... No, it could be that there is no quantum system. That in the h cross goes to 0, it gives you this classic answer. Uh, but, but if you have a quantum theory and you are trying to get a classical analog of that, I mean, shouldn't the final answer be same no matter what? <coughs> like, there are just two different ways of approaching the same. No, no. You see, you have to build. All you have in your hands is the classical system. 
Okay? You don't have two different quantum. Uh, until AESCFT, in some sense, we had zero quantum for gravity. Okay? You don't have a well a completely well defined quantum system whose classical limit you know gives you that. All the attempts have been to try to build a quantum system whose h bar goes to zero limit gives you the equations of gravity. And those attempts have been carried on for 80 years, starting with Dirac. Dirac, like a few weeks after he started, he quantized the electromagnetic field, he's rolled up his sleeve and said, let's start with gravity. <laughs> 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 it was a natural thing to do. It didn't work. Okay? And starting from then, it has not worked. This approach has not worked for 80 years. And who would be either? That's because we've not found the right way of making it work, we'll be really stupid, all kinds of things are possible. But there is one other possibility. You're just barking up the wrong tree. Now, how could we be barking up the wrong tree? We can't say that there is not a quantum theory of gravity. Because we're in the real world, the real world is gravity, the real world is quantum mechanics, and there's this beautiful theorem that quantum quantum theory is a jealous god. You know, that is inconsistent for half of the universe to be quantum mechanical on the other half. Do you know why this is true? Maybe we can make this a fun class. <laughs> can somebody explain to me why it's not considered consistent? Give me as an example. Why is it inconsistent? Have classical, classical quantum. You know, why could why could it be that the universe was so that standard model was quantum mechanical? Maybe. Why not? Is there something in principle that why do we need a quantum theory? Some reason. How would you argue that that's not possible? Or do you believe this possible? I've never seen any evidence of quantum gravity unless, unless you can't. Unless you can't fluctuation to English. That's probably the Okay, maybe the argument. Uh, forget what expense, but just in principle. Why is it? Let me give you a five minute reminder. This is something that you studied in. All, all, all of you read Feynman's lectures in physics, right? So whenever you read Feynman's lectures in physics, you know this, but I don't know. There's this beautiful experiment that he talks about. I will say experiment. Okay? In the early chapters of quantum mechanics, so somewhere else. I just remind you of this experiment. We do a five minute analysis of it just to draw a lesson. The lesson he does is that, um, see, he goes double slit at the screen. And he has an electron gun. A gun should be double slit. Okay? And he says, well, now let me do the following. First, I'll shut the screen. And I'll see how the intensity profile, this is some sort of sensitive screen, okay? Some photo multiplier. Something intense in the What do you what do you get? You know this. You get this. This thing. Okay. I'm I'm not saying that you should imagine this thing there. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you shut this screen, you get this. Let me draw these better. So let's draw. So here you get this guy, here you get that guy. Now if you keep them both open and you've never heard of quantum mechanics, what would you expect for them? If you kept them both open, you'd say, well, the intensity curves are some of the two. Something that looks something like something some of like this. And what is the argument? The argument is well, the electron goes through one slit or the other. The electrons are go through one slit. This slit don't care whether that one's open or not. So well, those that go through the shell from that point, those that go through this from that point. We sum it up. We get this. Sounds perfectly reasonable. Who 100 years ago would have questioned this, this argument? Okay? It is wrong. We do the experiment. This is this. It's famous. Young. Young fat. But let me see. Like you also see what it Okay? Now, I'm in, like any really good. You know, anyway, you're a thinking person who's not willing to accept, but still, okay? 
It's uncomfortable. This is, I've got a perfectly reasonable argument. It seems to depend on nothing but basic elementary logic. How could it be wrong? So he feels, well, this could be inconsistent. This must be inconsistent. If somebody, some experimentalist tells me this is the answer, it's experiment, but it may be wrong because it contradicts logic. But let's chase that down. How does it contradict logic? Okay. So, what he does next? He puts a little photon gun here. Okay? And says, well, let me shoot some photons here. And use the measure also the photons. Now, the photons, if the electron goes through here, the photons are deflected of the electron here. Photon, uh, photon goes through here, it's deflected of the electron here. By measuring the photons, I try to detect which electron the uh, which electron the best. Now, if I can do this experiment, then I have to get the sum of the two. Because those that go through here will follow the first pattern. Those that go through here, I can tag them. Okay? So something would be going wrong if I didn't just get the sum of the two. Unless somehow this guy non locally knows about that guy. It's hard to really us. Okay. So then, how, how does he proceed? He does this. And he finds the following. He finds that if, I mean, these are thought. <laughs> he finds that depending on the wavelength of the photon, uh, he gets, if the wavelength is very large, the interference pattern is not destroyed. If the wavelength is small, the interference pattern is destroyed, but it happens exactly in a way that doesn't contradict logic. Let me explain that. Suppose. Okay, sorry, I mean, this is just for fun. <laughs> but, but it's important. Suppose, suppose the distance between the two slats was very slits was very Suppose the wavelength of the electron was lambda s. Okay? And suppose the wavelength of the photon was lambda s. Okay. Now you send this this thing here. Where do you find the first destructive and what angle? You find the first destructive interference. According to your knowledge of wavelength. You know, in the experiment you find a destructive interference because we know what equations govern that we can predict with. Okay? And you know, right? Suppose this was a triangle. Uh, theta. And that theta is the same as this theta. This is the difference in path length. Between the two waves, that difference when that's half of a wavelength, which is structural interference. Theta is small, so we can approximate sine theta, tan theta, blah 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 by theta. So theta times d is equal to lambda e by 2, which is this first structural interference. Now, suppose you've got this photon which is tiny. Okay? The point is that no measurement is entirely unintrusive. It affects the electron. But how much does it affect the electron? And this is the main point. The main point is that not just the electron, also the photon is quantum mechanical. Because the photon is quantum mechanical, any particular quantum of the given wavelength has a minimum energy and a minimum momentum. What is the minimum momentum of a photon wavelength? Lambda. After some two pi is h bar by lambda p. What was the moment of the electron? Moment of the electron? H bar by lambda p. Okay. Now the photon hitting the electron kicks it. Okay. Let's assume that this kick is a small one. So and let's assume that gives it the maximum kick. So that how much will it change its angle? It will change its angle by lambda p by lambda a. Tan inverse of lambda p by lambda a. All are small. Okay? So delta, the kick, the kick angle, the kick angle, is equal to lambda p divided by lambda a. Okay? So we want to make sure that lambda p is small enough so that this delta p, delta p tan is much much less than uh, theta 
the, the typical angle scale of the interference pattern. Otherwise, typically this kicks with smear of the interference. Sorry. What? That should be higher. Actually, I'm Yeah, I, 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 love. Thank you. Okay. So this quantity has to be much less than. I, I got this wrong. Yeah, lambda is better. Thank you. Lambda is better. Lambda p, e by lambda p, must be much much less than. Uh, where was the b? Right? Uh, sorry, what was this? Lambda e by b. The formula for this structure was what? D sin theta is lambda. D sin theta is lambda. Ah, there's a D. So lambda. Yes. Lambda. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So theta 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 equal to lambda e by d. Right. So it must be much, much less than lambda e by d. Many nice things happen as well. First thing, nice thing, lambda e gets. Second nice thing is that you can rearrange this to say lambda p is much much greater than two d. So you can do this experiment and not smear out the interference pattern, provided lambda p is much much greater than two d. And you might say, well, okay, let's do it with lambda p much much greater than two d. Then we've got contribution. But we have something that you want. Yes, you see, it's a basic fact of wave motion that you cannot use. You cannot build a microscope that has resolution that is smaller than the wavelength of the light. So this scattering here of lambda p is much much larger than 2 d cannot sensitively detect, cannot distinguish between the electron and the Okay? So quantum mechanics lives, barely, but survives. <laughs> you see, it's on the edge of nonsense, quantum mechanics. It's poised on the edge. Push it a little and jumps off. Hmm. Okay? That, that, that's how the, you know, because it's, it's really took people so long to accept this interpretation of what we can see to make no sense. Okay, and you push it a little and jump off. How do you push it? One way to push it is to have electromagnetism classic. But the electron can't be here. Because, why? Because then, independent of what lambda p was, you could make the momentum arbitrarily small. That's a feature of classical. So classical physics, you can always do measurements probing something arbitrarily small, and then quantum mechanics would make sense. You see, so it's inconsistent. Now, I've said this in a colloquial way, you can try to make it more, more theorem like that. It doesn't add too much to it. This is the basic point. Okay? It's inconsistent to have a classical system, to have classical, classical quantum mechanics. So suppose <laughs> So suppose 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 gravity was classical. Now you can do the same experiment, not with photons. You should tell experimental friends to do that. <laughs> it would not be an easy experiment. Okay. But in principle you could. With gravity waves. Send quantum mechanics of the edge. Okay? Yeah. <coughs> so, so, you see, quantum mechanics requires everything. And it's quantum mechanics. So we have gravity. We know it's we know that it's should be quantum mechanics. So there must be a quantum theory of gravity. So the fact that people have failed to build one cannot be taken as an indication that one doesn't accept it. One must exist. Maybe we're just thinking wrong. And a new way of thinking, namely, in one particular example, the only really successful example, in my opinion, of correct, full content, right? It's basically the ADS theory construct. And that way gives you complete, oh, gives you the classical limit in this large n rather than one by This perhaps is an indication. And this is the correct way of one by non We don't know. It. Large n, uh, Classical theory has extra dimension to variable. Which, sorry, what do you mean? Your classical theory still has 
this is extra dimension, this is dimension five, this is dimension two constraints. In in the ca classical theory of gravity, you think? Yeah, in a normal way, in classical theory. Huh? This is h bar. So like uh, dimension two constraint usually means something for for a theory. Uh, well, let's see. See, let's take the particular example that we know when, uh, how it's going to So the gauge theory, the four-dimensional gauge theory, has no dimension for constants. Right? Because the gauge coupling in which you can absorb with each one okay, is dimensionless. So this combination of coupling times h power, which is all that we are getting, is dimensionless. Okay? Now, uh, uh, yeah, so this dimensionless physics um, actually, the gravity theory has a, has a dimension, but uh, that is an op can be ch can be changed by an arbitrary choice of scale. So basically, the way it works is that there are two dimension full quantities in the gravity theory. There's the radius of the area space, and there's the strip length on your space. Okay, and the appropriate dimensionless ratio of these is related to the gauge That's basically how the gauge works. Okay, so. Uh, the, the, the field theory would predict every dimensionless number you can build from that. And then there's one the arbitrary dimension scale, which is basically a choice of your Okay, any other questions before we get to more serious things? Okay, excellent. Sorry. So, uh, what, what, I can't remember where this started, but you asked a question. I can't remember what the question was, but I answered. You have a question. So, was that the story very early? Because the two three classes are very much later. You asked. Okay. Um, fine. So, uh, but I just want to emphasize that in the last class we've seen this classicalization very beautifully in the study of the matrix. So, it became a classical problem, but a different classical problem from the naive classical. Okay? And we're going to see more of this kind of thing working as well. Okay. So, uh, now we're going to continue with this. Uh, nothing else, we can continue our study of gauge theories. Okay. So far we've studied gauge theories in 0 plus 0 dimensions. And the gauge theories in 0 plus 1 dimension. But in both cases, we add in matter things. Now, in 4 dimensions, it's interesting to study gauge theories even just by themselves. The reason that in 0 plus 0 and 0 plus 1 dimensions, we are we, we, uh, um, we didn't try to study the pure gauge theory first before any matter. Is that these pure gauge theories in those low dimensions are empty. Okay? And I want to explain that statement to you. Uh, first, the analysis I'll do on the borders for the Abelian theory, but it's very easy to generalize for non So I'm gonna we're gonna have a tendon discussion on the structure of Maxwell's equations. Structure of the Abelian's equations. Okay, so suppose you've got the Lagrange. The equations of motion that follow from this equation are uh, d mu x mu. Okay, now um, in this for these linear equations, okay, for these linear equations, we might immediately want to know the answer to the following question. What are the classical solutions of this equation? How many classical solutions are there? Okay. Uh, as you know, the solutions are going to be waves. But how many waves are there? What do I mean by how many? In the counting that a single scalar field, del phi, del phi. Let's say that, that counting is that there is one wave. That's how many waves do we have here? Now, very naively, if we were in D space time, You might guess that the answer was D. But of course, that's not the right answer. The right answer, as you know very well, is D minus 2. Okay? And I'm going to give you two or three different ways of seeing it, of understanding this. Okay? This, by the way, will help us understand why gauge theories in up to two dimensions have no intrinsic, have basically no very little intrinsic dynamics. It's only in three or higher dimensions that you have a real wave set. It's a real Local dynamics in the gauge theory. Uh, yeah, so that fine. So let's let's try to analyze this. You see, one reason, of course, why the guess D is wrong 
is that we could engage in mechanics. So different solutions that are related to gate transformation are not going to be counted as different solutions. One way of dealing with this problem is to fix the gauge. Let's, so let's try to understand uh, this first classically, let's be talk about Okay. But the first classically, let's try to understand how to deal with this problem, um, with this issue, um, in different gauges. So one gauge that's often used in many kinds of analyses is to set the gauge that you can use. So what am I doing? Doing classical physics. Okay. I'm setting a gauge because I want to count solutions as distinct, only if they're not related by gauge transformation. Okay. <coughs> and now, when I do this, what happens to Maxwell's equations? So this becomes then new, of B new, A new. Now, this d mu goes through with hits this a mu. Okay? But by the gauge condition, that is zero. So this equation becomes the equation del squared. Okay? Now, again, the first side looks like there are d, d modes. But that's not true. Because if you go to momentum space, this equation becomes k squared of a of k, a mu of k is equal to zero. But we also knew that del mu a mu is zero. Okay? So k mu a mu of k is equal to zero. That one condition comes down the number of solutions by one. But that sounds like that d minus one keeps. Okay? Sounds like, okay, and you might think that's reasonable. We had D guys, we have to get rid of one of them by the transformation of some that D minus one bits. That's not the right answer. Why not? From this point of view, from this point of view, from this from point of view of this gauge, of this way of saying it, the answer is in a small subtlety that's very important. Small subtlety is that this condition does not completely fix. Okay? Uh, look, and the AMU goes to AMU plus LMU lambda. How does this condition change? It changes like L squared of lambda. So suppose you take a harmonic gauge transformation. A gauge transformation that itself obeys with massless minimally compensated. Then such a gauge transformation also continues to obey our gauge fixing condition. Okay? So any two of these solutions that are related to each other by such a gauge transformation, a gauge transformation lambda, okay, such that del squared lambda is equal to zero, um, such that del squared lambda is equal to zero, uh, is uh, should be followed with equivalent Okay? Now, you say, you might think that it's very unlikely that things would come out because this is a very particular kind of gauge transformation. And solutions to the equations of motion are very particular kinds of solutions. But these two particularities are the same. Both of them obey del squared and something is the same. So, in particular, suppose you take k mu is equal to k mu. Okay, a mu is equal to k mu. So suppose, in particular, suppose you k day, a mu is equal to del mu lambda. Okay, where lambda obeys del squared lambda is equal to zero. Then this a mu also obeys the equation for del squared lambda, a mu is obviously. So in the space of d minus one solutions <coughs> in this gauge, there is one gauge for the Okay, so in this space, so so what else? What's in this gate? How do we parameterize solutions? We parameterize solutions like a mu of k is equal. To, uh, the solution has k squared. Is equal to zero. Then we also need k mu a mu is equal to zero, and you have that a mu goes to a is equal is 
equal to a mu plus k mu lambda, where every function is supported on k squared. Okay? This equivalence allows you to make one more. Okay? This is how you see this in this is how you see this in the Lorentz sketch. Let me see this also in A0 sequence. Uh, what is this When you have mass, oh, but if you have mass, you don't have gauge in That's why you can't impose a I mean, the whole thing's totally different. Right. You can consistently impose a condition. You know, you can have a massive vector theory where you consistently. Now it depends on the, the question now depends on how you're making it. Okay. And you can consistently impose the condition del dot a is equal to zero. But now it depends on what your theory is. Okay. And so that's we really, right. It's a good question, but we need to specify. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, uh, if a of k is not zero and k square is not zero, how can the Oh, how, how can the product be zero? Because A has support only by K square. Okay. So, so A of K is zero unless K square is zero. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So, this is another way of saying that A of X is equal to e to pi K dot X <coughs> to blah blah blah, where K zero, you know mod k x0 plus k i x. Here, k has the mod only by k square x. Okay, so something I will do. Okay, great. Uh, now let's look at this whole, let's look at this problem in cool language. Sorry, in a0 equals a. Uh, I'm doing this largely because it will be useful for quantization. Because as you saw, our Method of getting the Hilbert space out of the path theory, the gauge theory, uh, gave a distinguished role for AC. Okay, so the cl closest classical analog to this is easy to make with zero gauge uh, for uh, theory. Okay, so suppose we work in AC to make zero gauge. Okay, so we've got these equations of motion, we've got D mu, F mu, mu. Zero. And we have a zero equals zero. So let's work out all the various steps. So what is F zero i? F zero i is simply a i dot. Then zero a i. Okay? What is F i j? Well that is whatever it is. Let's evaluate all the equations separately first. You know the, the, the equation of the free index zero. Okay. Let's evaluate the index of the free index zero. The equation of the free index zero. So that is del i of del i a j minus del j a i equal to zero. Plus L J X J I. 
Now, delta 0 and 0 i is uh, minus delta 0 squared a i minus because raising the 0 index. This is the F 0 i is the lower of this. Okay. Plus del j of f j i f j i is this and del j a i uh, uh, and del i a j is zero. And the reasons d minus 2 
in different gauges seems to have different answers. Uh, D minus 2 always goes to D minus 1 because you fix one gauge. But then that remaining thing goes back to D minus 2, either because there is a residue gauge invariance, or because of some combination of the residue gauge invariance, and an equation of motion. An equation of motion that's of a constraint. Okay? So I just say one, before telling the point of telling, I just say one more thing. One quick thing. Okay, let's let's do it Okay, before telling the point of telling, I say just one quick thing. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. I plan to talk about the space, but you can actually see the uh, two dimensional models on these on this okay? That'll probably be. Uh, we just need to prepare them. Okay, that's the answer. Okay. Um, fine. Yeah. So uh, before before like, um, uh, so I want to tell you one quick thing about the structure, one quick additional thing about the structure of Maxwell's equations, which is very useful to keep in mind. We've already seen this in this particular gauge, but this is just one more general thing, so I'll just say. You see, the equation of motion should L be F2 equal to zero, and logically of two sorts, if you think of them as a raw unit. That is the free index time, which is then mu F mu zero is equal. Now, this in, in this index mu runs over all variables, time and space. But actually it runs over the space. Because when this is time, this is also time, then zero zero is equal to zero. So this is going to be written as L i F i zero is equal to zero. And without any further analysis, you know that this equation cannot have a second derivative in time. Now, equations that do not have a second derivative, you see what is the structure of classical derivative? Like what's the structure of the classical differential equation del square phi is equal to The structure is this. You choose a space like space. You give phi and its first time derivative. Now, then that equation will evolve this data. That's what a differential equation does. Right? That was one way the initial, the initial, initial value problem. The initial value is phi and phi dot. And the equation takes a full Okay. So this equation is not doing it. It's not telling you how to take A and A dot forward in time. It's doing something else. It's telling you that the data you're allowed to specify on your initial slides must obey this constraint. Because it's some equation that, real, that constrains allowed values of AIs and AI dots. Some such equations are called constraint equations. So if you slice Maxwell's equations in ordinary space and time, you can think of time condition. The zero component of Maxwell's equations is a constraint equation. We saw this here. We saw the explicit in the zero, zero gauge, but it's technically true. This is a constraint equation. The other components of Maxwell's equations, as we saw explicitly here, they all have second derivatives in time, and so dynamic equations. Okay? So, what is the structure of Maxwell's equations? The structure of Maxwell's equations is that you take, that you can't put whatever data you want to express. You have to choose the data to constrain by itself. Once you've chosen that data, that data is evolved forward in time by the dynamic equations. Okay? Now, there's a potential paradox. Because what if you take data that satisfies a constraint equation, evolve the forward in time, and find that no longer satisfies your constraint equation. Okay? That would mean Maxwell's equation to be inconsistent. Because we know that can't happen because it comes from reactions. It's consistent equation to push. But let's try to understand algebraically how that happens. What we need to show is that the constraint equation, that the dynamical equations which evolve data forward time, do not change the fact that the constraint equation is obeyed. So what was the constraint equation? This one. What is the dynamical? So what we need to check, we need to check what this is. What? Using only the dynamic equations. Hmm? No, no. It's not trivial. You know, because we're not going to allow ourselves to use this equation. Say again? Once you do a symmetric in 0 and 8, 
Okay? Fine. But what do we know from the dynamical equations? From the dynamical equations, we know that del 0, f i 0, plus del j, f i j, is equal to 0. So we can replace this. We take this 0. You can replace this by this. And then you're good.
and we're going to follow our discussion of how to quantize this theory. So now our discussion of how to quantize the theory, our Hilbert space was given, our Hilbert space was given by uh, uh, wave function square integral wave functionals of AI. Subject to the condition of psi of AI is equal to psi of gauge transform. Wave function of our theory. Okay? Now, we're in two dimensions, and we're going to take a two dimensional quantum field theory with time and space being As you can see, we didn't take this S1 wave temperature in the class. S1 is one of the Alright? So you've got a two dimensional quantum field theory in a circle. <coughs> okay? You've got a two dimensional quantum field theory in a circle. And we want, we, want, we want to understand Hilbert space and you know, the energies. We want to find, solve the problem. We to solve the Schrodinger problem. For this problem, you see. Now, um, this is actually surprisingly easy. It's surprisingly easy for the problem that in one, you see, we've got effectively one dimension. And in one dimension, any okay, sorry. Uh, Okay, so uh, 
Now, what is the right state? Suppose, so not all gauge configurations are equal, but all gauge configurations with the same intake are equal. Therefore, the only gauge engineering data, the only physical data is the integral of it. Okay? So, we can always, because you know, given any integral, there's always one configuration that gives you that integral in this concept. We can always use gauge transformations, these gauge transformations, to set A1 equals to constant. Okay? So, what was what were, what, what was our rule for quantization? The first rule was psi psi is a wave function of uh, of a one subject to this that psi is function only you know it doesn't care about it depends it's invariant other gauge transformations and therefore we can solve that condition by making psi only a function of a one which is now not a function of x okay just now. Okay? Now, um, uh, what was the second part of our rule? The second part of our rule was that after that, the problem is just the problem that you get from the uh, Yangle's equation, uh, the, the Yangle's action. Just setting A0 equals 0. You remember? We have this. <laughs> At, you remember how we did the quantization? We did the quantization for the AI. The A0 is treated as a constant background value. That integration over A0 gives you this constraint. <coughs> okay? So the angle's action with A0 with A0 set equal to 0 is very simple. What is it? It is just A1 dot square. 1 by, let's say, 2 g squared. Okay? And therefore, this problem is extremely simple. This problem, really, the, the problem of Yangle theory, of U1 Yangle theory, okay, the problem of U1 Yangle theory reduces to the problem of U1 Yangle theory reduces to um, uh, reduces to uh, the quantum mechanics of a non-relativistic particle with some effective value of this. Until you also trace. Yeah. 
Kan di setan Bukan siksa aja pada sudut Dan Saya tak baca Kodrana kau say Was that What we should do Is to take You know there's a physical body Which is the circle of Wilson Okay. So the far more modern exponential of x, how do you write that? The exponential of uh, I out. I in the x. Everyone I unit. Okay. How does this quantity transform under the transform? Okay, now firstly I have to tell you what this path of ordinary explanation is. If we were an abelian theory, it would just be an ordinary explanation. The non-abelian theory what this means is the following. E to the power i a dx, e to the power i a dx That is you break up the integral from 0 to let's say 2 pi, which is 10%, or so let's say 2 pi l into little dx regions and you multiply a from this point and dx like this because each of these are matrices they don't commute this is not the same as you know summing something up from the exponent okay now how does why do you have to take an exponent at all you'll see okay the reason we take an exponent is that we want to know how we want to build something to each other. Hang on for a minute. Yes. So this quantity, how does it transform under the transformation? So suppose let's take something here. So suppose this was this this dx took you from x1 to x1 plus delta x1. Okay? And you need to check that the gauge transformation rule for the A field means that this quantity transforms like ux1 e to the power i a dx times u inverse x1 plus delta x1. <coughs> okay? Now, because of that, this whole object transforms nicely under gauge transformations. Because in between this and that cancel. Okay? So the whole object transforms like this whole path order exponential transforms like u at wherever you started, x start times e to the pi path order in pi a in dx times u inverse of x end. Okay? Now, suppose we've got the circle. Then x star is equal to x. Alright? We're only going to look at objects that obey, uh, you know, the, we'll only look at period, uh, gate transformations that are periodic. Okay? So u inverse, u, u inverse are the same. <coughs> Let's say this is u equals 0, this is 2 pi l, so this is 0. So this exponential, or this, this integral itself, transforms nicely under a gate transformation. But it does transform. Okay. The only part of the data that, it, that things are going to allow, allow to depend on are the gate invariant data. The gate invariant data are the eigenvalues of this object. Okay, that's that's the point. Okay, very good. So uh, one way of saying it is that <coughs> the gate invariant data, the traces of this object and its various parts. Okay. Those are the that's 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 the same data as the eigenvalues. Okay. Now, <coughs> this way of thinking of it makes clear something else. Okay. It makes clear that if you have two different matrices A, okay, if you have two different matrices A such that their eigenvalues, uh, suppose we've got the eigenvalues alpha 1, alpha n, yeah, matrices and eigenvalues are the same, not the same. Okay. But suppose I take any one of these values and I put plus 2 pi. Okay? It also gives me the same thing for this path order exponential. Because all that I care about is the eigenvalues. 
the argument is up on the exponent. Okay? Uh, so you can see this in various ways. But up to gauge transformations, you can diagonalize these a, uh, this A1. Uh, you can make it constant. And matrices, okay, matrices with eigenvalues that differ by 2 pi are actually equivalent. So what this problem is, is the quantum mechanics of now, okay, so now what, what, what was our lesson from yesterday? Our lesson from yesterday was that when you take matrix quantum mechanics, it becomes quantum mechanics of, not yesterday, Wednesday, uh, it becomes quantum mechanics of eigenvalues. Okay, you've got the n different eigenvalues, but the whole point of doing all our clever stuff in Wednesday's class was the eigenvalues became effectively full. Okay? So now we've reduced to that problem. Except that now the fermions are living in a circle of length 2 pi. Okay? Of course, we've got this g squared the angles up here. We could absorb that into A, effectively rescaling the length of the circle. Okay? So if we make the fermions out of standard kinetic term, half raise. A1 square, A1 square, these guys will live on, on a circle of length 2 pi gx. Okay? So this is our final conclusion. I haven't been as thorough about it. If you read the papers, they take much more care to establish all the conclusions. But maybe I've made it clear what the physics is. Okay? The uh, uh, end result is this. Take 2D angles theory on a circle. Okay? Take 2D angles theory on a circle, and I, 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 uh, um, I did one thing badly because yeah, uh, I did one thing badly. Did one thing badly because it's the eigenvalues of this object that are being very complex. But this object is a times 2 pi. A. Where L was less than the actual physical circle. Okay? So, A times 2 pi L has periodicity 2 pi. A times 2 pi L has periodicity 2 pi. So, A had periodicity 1 by L. Right? A had periodicity 1 by L. And so this rescaled quantum mechanics problem has a periodicity g angle no two pi. And so that alpha one should be alpha one plus one. Yeah, it's alpha one plus. Uh, uh, really, this alpha one should be thought of as the eigenvalues of this whole function. ADL. That is correct. Okay. So the periodicity of the rescale quantum mechanics problem is g angles back. Okay? So you take the angles, 2D angles theory. Uh, we take 2D angles theory on a, uh, on a circle of length, of, of length 2 pi at coupling cost of g angles. This problem is identical. In fact, this problem is the problem of n fermions living n identical fermions, living on a circle of length g angles by n. Isn't that quite incredible? Who would you have thought of this? You thought this, you see the 2D angles here reaction. Seems like nothing. But actually, the physics of this problem, this problem is just exactly a restatement of n free fermions living on a circle, L n free identical fermions living on a circle of uh, uh, of uh, length 2 pi uh, g by L and therefore uh, you know radius g by 2 pi okay so this problem of course we know the solution it's a very easily solved okay. so 2D angles theory was the first place is, is this clear okay 2D angles theory was the first place 
where we saw some some not completely trivial physics associated with the Bjorni scale. But it was pretty trivial. But not entirely trivial. These fermions, free fermions are not nothing, right? Condensed matter physicists spend half the life of free fermions. <laughs> 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 So, uh, they're not nothing. They're all nothing. It's very easy. Okay, excellent. But we, 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 we saw the general lesson. We saw the general lesson. The general lesson was that uh, uh, the truly theory was solvable because it's not local degrees. Only degrees of freedom are global. Associated with these holonomies. Around the circle. And because of that, that reduced 2D angle scaling to a problem of quantum mechanics. Luckily, it turned out to be a solvable quantum mechanics. Sir, if we do it in higher dimensions, can we generalize it like it's a 3D or something? Mm. No. The problem with 3D is, as we've discussed, the number of photonic degrees of freedom is one. Now we have to do real physics. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out of now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go on. Oh, yeah. So, the way you showed it, it seems as if only the sum of the eigenvalues are, you know, some of the eigenvalues to holonomy is a... No, but also sum of squares of eigenvalues. Because you can take this thing and wind it twice at the matrix. And sum of cubes of eigenvalues. And sum of the fourth part of the eigenvalues. Therefore, I want the eigenvalues up to permutation. Okay? Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, excellent. So now we want to we want to move on to doing less trivial physics with uh, uh, with the angular scales. Okay, um, and in two dimensions that means adding that. Okay, but uh, 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 now if you take two dimensional angular scales and do what we did, the analog of what we did in 0 plus 0 dimensions, 0 plus 1 dimensions. So add an adjoint value of freedom. That problem is already too hard to solve, even with the large element. Okay? You know, so even these will be problems. There's a gradation. And this, this one, I would give a lot to be able to solve. We have to be in the theory of the with an adjoint scale of freedom. Oh, don't solve. Okay. However, Gerard Toft, uh, that great theoretical physicist of the 1970s, um, uh, managed to solve a simpler problem. That is, take 2D angular scale and uh, uh, couple it to fundamental, fundamental matter, matter, fundamental matter, the logic. Now, um, <coughs> you see the basic point about coupling a fundamental matter is that we've seen that, as we saw, as we've seen over the last two or three lectures, large end limits are interesting. But large end limits for vector-like things are simpler than large end limits for matrix things. Now, Yangman's theory always has matrices because gauge fields are interesting. But in two dimensions, the gauge fields are almost, almost empty. Right? It's almost empty. Therefore, if you come to Fundamental theories it's sort of like with large end limits for vector length theories. Okay? But so in preparation for the analysis that we did in the next class, I'm going to start trying to understand more clearly the large end limit of diagrammatics, finally. Okay? Uh, the analysis I do now will apply to every dimension, it's just a general analysis. Um, it was done by Toft, also in a separate paper. From Toft in the 1970s wrote about 20, 15, 16, totally amazing papers. You know, each of them with great originality, great creativity, and great technical accomplishment. So it's once one after the other. So we we'll discuss two of his papers. <laughs> okay, so. The general analysis applies to any matrix theory which we scale in the following way. Let's say D phi, phi, phi i's are n cross n matrices. 
Okay. And let us first look at the analysis, which is tangent. So we've got minus n times trace something. L phi over L something. Trace of some function of the matrix. Plus V of phi plus whatever. This is what applies. The angle scales to the, the matrix 0 plus 0 dimensional matrix that I will be studying. Plus plus is general analysis matrix. What we want to do is to understand how perturbation theory works. We want to understand counting of powers of any perturbation. Okay? So let me, it will make very little difference, but let me just be totally specific. Uh, suppose we have del mu, del phi over the square plus phi q. That's our theory. Okay? Now, I want, given any Feynman diagram, I want to be able to efficiently count. Okay? I want to be able to efficiently count the powers of n in this Feynman diagram. Okay? And to this end, I introduce the following notation. This phi field is a, the, the field for the matrix phi i j. Now, this has two indices the i index and the j index. So, I introduce the following notation for the final diagram. The propagate of this phi field I broaden out into a double ring, where the top line gets an arrow which keeps track of the fundamental points. The bottom line gets an arrow that keeps track of the end fundamental Just a bit of notation, changing my notation for the propagate of this phi field. <coughs> okay. Now the point of this notation is that gauge invariance ensures that these indices can know where I am. Yes, you will. Better stop. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, the gauge invariance ensures that these indices can know where I am. What is the phi cube vertex? It looks like this. Okay. Let's Why is this true? Because it's just what you get if you write. What, what do we have here? We have phi i j, phi j k, phi k i. Because trace of. And that's what this is. This is phi i j, phi j k, phi k. Okay? So the final diagrams for these, yeah, that's what I'm stuck to. Right. Well, the final diagrams for these for these matrix series look like this. The vertex factor looks like this. Okay. Now I'm going to let me take a sample diagram. Let me take a diagram like this. Okay, first I'll draw it in order limitation. So suppose I take a diagram like this. A vacuum bubble diagram. And I thicken it out to double line notation. Okay? How could how how could it Do you understand? Okay, I could put arrows. Okay, now let me experiment around a little bit. 
let me do the following. Suppose I had another property here, like this. How has this changed? It's changed in various ways. I've added one more propagator, so it's one other one additional factor of one over here. Sorry, I've added time. Let me count the total number of propagators. Uh, so, how many different propagators were there? This was just sorry. So let's draw this, this diagram, which was like this. What have I done to it? Basically, this. I've done this. How many propagators do we? One, two, three. Four, five, six, 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 six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I've now got an additional factor of one by n q because I've got three new properties. How many new vertices do I have? One, two new vertices. Okay. N squared. How many new index lines do I have? Well, one new index. So this additional power of n cancelled when I complicated this graph in this particular manner. Okay? But what, 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 what particular manner was this? What it was was just taking this, this graph that I drew on a surface and breaking it up into breaking up the so imagine that you think of this 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 thing here as like a tiling. What I did was to break up the tiles into smaller tiles. That did not change. The, that did not change the power of n. Okay. Now I won't have the time today, so I think we'll stop here. But what's the punchline? The punchline, as we will show, is that this is generally true. That if you take some surface, imagine this graph is some some. Uh, you know, something you can draw on a surface. And then you just keep changing the tiling of that surface. That does not change the power of it. However, not all graphs describe the same surface. Okay? Imagine if you take this outer line and shrunk it for a moment in your head. And so imagine that the surface includes not just the surface like this, but also the other side. That's the correct way to think of the surface. Okay? Then this surface is a sphere. Okay? And any Feynman diagram which in double line rotation can be drawn on, can be drawn without lines crossing each other on a sphere. Or on a plane if you don't close that for the line. Uh, I'm through, I'm through, so you don't need to change. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll have the same power of However, not every diagram can be drawn on a sphere or a plane without using each other. Some diagrams, that in order to be able to be drawn without crossing each other, would need to be drawn on doors. Some diagrams would need to be drawn on the genus to surface. Now, that's a beautiful classification of compact two dimensional manifolds. They're classified by what's called a genus, which is one number. It's basically how many holes, if you think of it like a pretzel. It's how many holes there are in the pretzel. So a sphere has no holes. The torus is one hole. The genus two surface is two holes. We'll talk about Okay. And the beautiful result of top root that we will show in the next class is that the power of n for such diagrams is like n squared to the power 2 minus 2 g. n to the power 2 minus 2 g. The g is the genus. The sphere at genus zero is so displaying the graphs that we were looking at. Okay? Uh, the torus, which has genus one, will have a to the power zero. So, what we see is something quite, quite, quite beautiful. That diagrammatically, the one over n limit, the large n limit, gives us a new parameter which organizes the graphs, the final graphs of the quantum theory into graphs according to some sort of topology. And each topology has an infinite number of graphs. And solving the theory at large n is analogous to summing all the graphs. It's not analogous, it's the same as summing all the graphs that can be drawn on a sphere. These are sometimes called planar graphs. The sphere, only if you close off the large n, 
simpler way to say it is that it can be drawn on a sheet of paper without any two propagators going over it. Okay? So that, uh, uh, so we will prove this in the next class and then we will use this result to try to solve two dimensional QCD with the dimension uh, in the next class. Okay, uh, thank you. Any very quick questions after? QCD is not What? So, <laughs> your point is? <laughs> But more seriously, uh, more seriously, you see, this is something I, uh, I may have said before in the class, but say, you know, you have, uh, what, one has to be, one has to be, what is the role, what are, what can a theoretical physicist hope to? You see, there are some problems, but most problems in the world, that are so complicated that likely a theoretical physicist without the aid of some crazy computer okay, will never be able to solve them. Not in the history of humanity. Okay. However, that doesn't stop theorists from making progress. How do we make progress? We take the space of problems and find spots where we can solve them. And then we do perturbation theory. And by finding these spots and doing this perturbation theory, we fill out a qualitative picture that helps us qualitatively understand the whole space. Even though we can quantitatively theoretically solve only in special points. But these special points are totally invalid. The points in the space of theories, because without them you would have no theoretical help. After you have this qualitative picture, to get numbers in any way, It feels like a cheat, but it seems like there's nothing better we can do than to go to some computer. But without having the qualitative picture, that wouldn't work. So you wouldn't know what to do on the computer. You wouldn't be able to understand the results. Okay? So this is the realistic view of what a theorist can work. Okay? So QCD in three dimensions with the masses of the quarks as they are, is probably the kind of problem that human beings will never solve without a computer. Okay. You just look at the spectrum of mesons, for instance. So complicated. It just seems very unlikely that those numbers would come just out of the human brain. You know, maybe some number crunching that would be possible. So, are we going to just give up and say, well, okay, we'll all do last case then? Surely not. That's a cop out for the <laughs> <laughs> What do we have to do? is to find those points we can understand with our mind. And only those that we cannot leave to. But you, so this is what we must do. So for instance, suppose you could solve QCD at large. And it had the qualitative features of QCD. Or some quality. That would be a good thing. Because it would be a new point in the space of things that helps us fill out this. Okay. So, some problems of the real world are easy enough to just solve, like the hydrogen atom. But those extremely rare. Okay? So, deforming problems of the real world to solvable problems which do not give up, which capture some of the content, is the essence of theoretical physics. Okay. Yeah, this is my point. Okay. So, next class, Monday. Right? Monday is not. Thank <laughs> <laughs>